Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. For centuries, both churchmen and laymen have been defining the devil according to their needs, all the while playing the game of muzzling the enemy. They've been inventing the rules of how devils should behave, how Satanists should behave, how devil worshippers should act. And they have been in an authoritative position to do this because naturally they are the men of God, they are the men of the church. Supposedly they are the men who have been doing battle with this devil and been absolving their parishioners of these devil's promptings. In this manner have they maintained a convenient means by which to escape the blame for their inadequacies or indiscretions. The devil made me do it has long been a stock alibi. Once it held, it held very firm. Now, fortunately, fortunately for us, it has become ludicrous to say the devil made me do it. Anton LaVey was born April 11th, 1930. Founder of the Church of Satan, as well as a writer, a cultist, and musician, the author of the Satanic Bible, and founder of something we know as LaVeyan Satanism, for there are many branches out there. And we're going to talk a whole lot about LaVey. I've got some sound bites from Anton LaVey. We're going to be speaking a little later on this hour with the high priest of the Church of Satan. Peter Gilmore is going to spend some time to talk about what it is, what it isn't, why it exists, why be a Satanist as opposed to something else. Is it really all the evil things that they told us about growing up? And it was taught when I was a kid. We were in uh, private Christian school, fifth, sixth, uh, seventh grade. This was, you know, back in the early 80s. And everything was satanic. Everything was satanic. They played our records backwards. They found Satan in TV shows and in films and in all manner of pop culture icons, and they would warn us about the evils of Satan. And of course, if you ever mentioned the Church of Satan or the Satanic Bible, there was a chill in the room. Everybody stopped talking. The Church of Satan... The Satanic Bible. They worship the devil. They worship Satan. They worship the enemy of God. We were taught that any sort of delving into the subject of Satanism is actually dangerous because if you were to get too close, you might open the doors, the portals of hell, where demon influence could taint you. I'm not making this up. They would talk about occultists, people who would go and study the occult and Satanism and all these offshoots of Satanism, and they would be personally, spiritually affected for the rest of their lives. It's like a haunting almost. The evil had imprinted itself on the person, even though it was a good person, even though it was a believer. It's dangerous stuff. Stay away, stay away. It was provocative. It was something that people used to scare us, which is probably what Anton LaVey intended all along. Anton LaVey started presenting these lectures on the occult and rituals back in the 60s. And uh, apparently somebody in the circle suggested, hey, this may be the basis for a new religion. On the 30th of April, 1966, Anton LaVey ritualistically shaved his head, supposedly in the tradition of ancient executioners. And he declared the founding of the Church of Satan, and he proclaimed 66 as the first year in the age of Satan. He performed satanic baptisms and satanic funerals. 
In the late 1960s and 70s, he melded his ideological influences with the ritual practices of the Church of Satan. And he has been interviewed or was interviewed during his lifetime in publications like Newsweek and Time. He was on Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. He was on Phil Donahue, among others. You can see many of these interviews now on YouTube. So do they really believe in the devil? I mean, what is the Church of Satan? The Church of Satan is an organization which is comprised of Satanists who, because of their abilities and lifestyles, and I must stress this, lifestyles, reflect a higher-than-average human potential. Through this avenue, the Church of Satan, the Satanist will become the prototype for a more rational, certainly more finely tuned society. It all sounds very lofty when he says it in that sort of ominous tone. But do they really worship the devil? These are his own words. Satan is to us a symbol rather than an anthropomorphic being. Although many members of the Church of Satan who are mystically inclined would prefer to think of Satan in a very real anthropomorphic way. Of course, we do not discourage this because we realize that to many individuals, a picture, a well-wrought picture of their mentor or of their tutelary divinity is very important for them to conceptualize ritualistically. However, Satan symbolically is the teacher the informer of the whys and the wherefores of the world. In answer to those who would label us devil worshippers or be very quick to assume us to be Satan worshippers, I must say that Satan demands study, not worship, in its truest symbology. We're going to go to your calls and see what you have to say before we get into the more formal interviews a little later on this hour. I've got an 805 on the switchboard. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Thanks for helping me kick off the show. Who's this? Is this 805, did you Eight, say? Yeah, this is 805. You calling to uh, be a part of the show? Yes. Uh, listen, um, yeah, I've had a little bit of being around uh, these people that actually call themselves Satanists. I have four friends who've been in it, uh, one who's still in it. And matter of fact, I got to go to his wedding, and they did it in a satanic or whatever they did in their uh, show. And I have to say, everybody gives me crap about it. They were like, oh, my God, you went to this thing? And I said, yeah, it was uh, actually very entertaining. It was fun. Uh, I didn't get this vibe like they were really worshiping anything. I think it was just pure entertainment. And um, I really didn't see the harm in it. Uh, it's not my cup of tea. I've read the book. Uh, but, you know, hey, each to their own, and I really was not affected. I, it didn't change anything. Matter of fact, it just I felt like when the more I was around it, um, to me, and I like the way, way my friend said it. Uh, he said, you know, we get into these theatrical ways of carrying ourselves, but – uh, at least we admit that we're being pure actors up on stage, unlike Christianity won't admit that they're just being pure actors up on stage and just playing out a role. We enjoy playing our role, but my big problem with Satanism for me, uh, not saying that it's a problem, but uh, it's a very selfish one, which is fine. Uh, but I think there's also a balance with selfishness a little bit. And uh, so on those parts, I was – you know, that it really wasn't my cup of tea, but I don't see anything wrong with it, and I didn't see any harm in it, and, and all the hoopla they made out of it. Was well, tell me about the ceremony. I mean, was there an altar? Was there the Princess of Lust? <laughs> Did they do all of yeah, those types they, of things? Tell me about it. Oh, yeah, they had like, uh, you know, they had the big uh, bathroom up there. Uh, they had this altar. Uh, they did the whole thing. Uh, this woman was the uh, was, I guess, one of the priests. And I guess they're associated, from what I gather, he told me, uh, with uh, Peter's uh, group. And they're out of here. I'm out of Hollywood, California, but I live up here in Santa Barbara. And uh, this was about six years ago when I went to go see uh, this thing, and he invited me. And uh, 
Yeah, it was like this whole ceremony, and they did it with, you know, they had the sword, and they would, uh, they would do these particular sayings, and I, I can't say the names of them because I'm really not that familiar with them. I was going to try to get my friend to call in, but he kind of refused, <laughs> and the nature of his business. <laughs> well, it's probably not the kind of thing you want on a resume. I mean, I, I, I you know, you know you, it's sort of a, there's a tad, there's a little stigma with the, the Church of Satan that I can, I think I can understand. But you went and you had oh, a good I'm- time, and you found it relatively benign, and, and it was all theater, huh? It was all theater. And, you know, Peter has said that, too. And, um, you know, and that's really what it, I thought I had. I'll be honest with you. I had a lot of fun. And I told people that I said it was absolutely a blast. I didn't feel threatened. These people were not threatening. They were there to have a good time. That was it. It was a beautiful time that they had. And it was just like going to some gothic vampire uh you know, set up instead of being all, you know, churchy wetty and, you know, birds flying in the wind and all this kind of stuff. No, it was, it was like going to a black metal, dark death metal thing, but with fun and happiness and cheery and, and they were just having a good time. I mean, I, I had the best time. I was laughing. I was carrying on. The people were, I had great conversations. Um, you know, it beats the hell and, out of doing a traditional ceremony that sounds like every other ceremony that's been done. At least you got a new memory out of the deal, a new life experience for sure. I'm really glad I did. Um, matter of fact, I was going to have them on this radio show that I do a radio show, which I've actually did. Hey, I got to tell you this, and I don't want to take up your time. I know you got other callers, and you can always kick me off when you're ready. But, um, I want to tell you that you've been a huge influence on me. And out here in California, uh, I've introduced you to so many people to go on your tube and also your uh, website. And I'm still trying to get on. To, I've been emailing you, but I'm eventually going to get a bunch of T-shirts because everybody really loves that T-shirt called uh, uh, You Pray For Me and I'll Think For You. You like that but, one, yeah. <laughs> Well, oh, everybody uh, does. Awesome. Well, it and means when a I lot. show that, on top of that, on a radio show, we've played some of your clips of like Noah's Ark and all that. But I always did it. I just want you to know that I did it and always promoted you because I, I have to say you're, you're, you've got some brilliant videos. Uh, I've been totally impressed with what you have, and I'm well, really glad you're bringing this subject up because I think it has been totally misconstrued and it's. And I think it's time to put this out on the plate and sort of hopefully put it to rest. Well, you should have some new ammo shortly. I'm editing a uh, a video tour of our trip to Kentucky's Creation Museum. That should post later on this month. (laughs) I started the edit this week, and I will tell you, that I'm, the the head the forehead is just pink from the face palming that's been going on since I started. <laughs> thanks for the call. Thanks for kicking off the show, and thanks for the kind words. It means a lot to me. Appreciate you, man. Oh no problem. You have a beautiful day, and for on my behalf, tell uh, Peter uh, that I said hello and uh, keep up the party. <laughs> All right, take it easy. Just everybody says wants to say hi to the high priest of the Church of Satan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Y'all are going straight to hell. <laughs> The Satanic Bible was always something that was uh, you know, it was very ominous you know, when they talked about it. The Satanic Bible. Would you like to hear the nine Satanic statements? They are as follows. Number one, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Number two, Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Three, Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Four, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Five, Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Six, Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. 7. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who because of his, quote, divine spiritual and intellectual development, unquote, has become the most vicious animal of all. 8. Satan represents all of the so-called sins, as they all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. 9. Satan has been, 
the best friend the church has ever had, as he has kept it in business all these years. Had an email from someone who had personal experience with Anton LeVay in the Church of Satan. Her name is Kitty. She says this, By the time I was exposed to Anton when I was nearly 16 and he was less than a decade from his death, I was already steeped in esoterica, mythology, folklore, and counterculture. I found that if I asked a question of him that he would speak freely and pontificate at length for as much to share his knowledge with you as to hear himself speak. I didn't find him to be hardly the bastard that a young girl in the late 80s might be prone to hear that he was. These circles of metaphysical types can be torrid beds of rumor and gossip. I never really understood the sniping and the biting that can go on among people that profess to believe in concepts like karma. Satanists don't necessarily believe in karma. Just to be clear, I'm speaking more to the pagan New Age community in general. Anyway, I was not aware that he had a certain reputation but I never bore witness to it. Philosophically speaking, I've always appreciated the ideas that you must put yourself first and take responsibility for your own choices and actions. Be objective, be honest, own your sacrifice of, pardon me, own your practice of magic, and be passionate in your life, your love, and your ritual. While Wicca, and even to some degree, Thelema, Hermeticism, we're saying love and light, harm none, love is the whole of the law, etc. Anton said, hey, if you hate someone and you want to wish them great harm, knock yourself out, but you better own your shit. While all of New Age was being very fluffy and Jedi, Anton came in like the Sith and said, denial of anything, pleasure, pain, good, bad, light, dark is just bullocks. Kitty continues, don't waste your time with anything that doesn't bring you closer to your goal or serve your higher purpose. He said, you are your God and only you can walk your journey. And you're only going to get this time to do it. The adversary is inside of you. Use a system of meditation and ritual to develop your focus to get what you want. Conquer your inner barriers. For some people, I saw this become a fanciful and elaborate self-delusion that they were making everything happen just by force of will. This is rampant in magical types, and it becomes very irritating very quickly. I'm sure you can see at this point that while I was pleased to share in the conversations about things like what patterns in human behavior get them stuck, and the nature of self-help, spirituality, gurus, etc., and how Levian Satanism openly mocked both monotheism and even its pagan neighbors. I don't have a great deal of patience for some of the personality types that gravitate to a philosophical order that espouses indulgence of the ego. The Church of Satan, at its inception, made great commentary on human nature and offered ways to moderate your behavior to achieve a more satisfactory outcome to your life. It's not terribly groundbreaking, I don't think anything really is. I think we sometimes get charismatic people that can articulate their paradigm and have it resonate with people. I think that was Anton LaVey. At length, as I moved on to learn about other things, we did not keep touch. I would think he thought little of it, and like his philosophy of do what's best for you, just assumed I was off doing what was best for me. Kitty, thank you very much for the message. Okay, we go back to the switchboard here with someone who has experience in another flavor of Satanism. What's your name? My name is Dominic Rossetto. All right, so you were a member of what organization? Uh, the organization was called The Process, Church of the Final Judgment. Well, that's kind of an ominous title. I mean, what was it? Was it a, yeah. a Satanist church? Was it something else? Satan was a big part of it. The, the, the church believed in the unity of Christ and Satan that they were, they were both parts of the same whole. As a matter of fact, their teachings started out with four principal deities. Uh, it's kind of like the whole four-pole universe kind of thing, where you had Jehovah, Lucifer, Satan, and Christ, all separate aspects of the same kind of Godhead. So they were part of each other. Were they like the good and the evil twin? Um, yeah, um, well, uh, kind of like, you, well, even in the Bible, there are passages where Jehovah says that uh, I, I created evil. The whole idea is that good and evil can't exist without one another. So what did you guys do? Did you have a holy book? Did you have mantras that you chanted? Did you have ritual? What did you do? We had a lot of ritual, 
Um, uh, we had a, a Sabbath assembly every Saturday. Um, we had teachings that came down from a person that we called the teacher. That was a guy named Robert de Grimston. They believed that mankind has gone wrong, that, uh, that we spend our time denying what we really are and what's really going on, and that the end of the world is coming. And uh, when the world ends, everything's going to be brought together. And uh, if you weren't one of the, uh, the ones that knew what was going on, then you were really kind of screwed. Kind of a um, weird mix. You've got apocalyptic teaching. You've got a little bit of the Book of Revelation. You've got a little bit of Heaven's Gate, uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of Jediism. <laughs> you've got a whole potpourri of belief systems. It was all in there. I was a minister of the church for about four years. This was in the mid-70s. You're not a member now. No. The organization is pretty much defunct. I mean, there are parts of it around. A good portion of the people that were left started a really big animal sanctuary and do wonderful things with animals, uh, which is <laughs> nice. They've gotten out of religion. <laughs> it just came out of your mouth a certain way, and I, it just caught me. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> do wonderful things with animals, yeah. <laughs> well, they went out, and now they do wonderful things with animals. <laughs> Um, so uh, how did you well, get you know, from I the? I can't deny what they might do with animals. <laughs> what, how did you get from the four poles and the evil twin and the <laughs> end of the world to being an out and out atheist? What happened to you? Well, for me, I, the, the, it was a wonderful thing in a way for me because what happened is I learned a lot about how you control people by using religion, and. Uh, because, you know, I mean, naturally, as a, as a minister, part of your function is to bring people into the fold and uh, to get them to stay. Well, you get them to stay by controlling them. And, you, and uh, a lot I, that I learned was the way that you use validation to make a person feel wonderful, to make a person feel welcome, to make the person feel like they're more important than they thought they were. And uh, if you keep doing this, they're going to hang around. Then, of course, part of what you do is you ask them for either money or services, and when they give them that to you, you validate them some more. And if they don't, well, then you sort of kind of cut them off, in which case they're going to come back and, and look for what they were getting before that they're not getting now. Well, what's your take on the actual Church of Satan? They reject any idea of any deity. They're just kind of playing up the man-as-God aspect of it. What's your perspective on them? Well, I did get to actually know a lot of people that were involved with that kind of thing, being that our church, uh, <laughs> you know, had the whole Satan aspect, so we got a lot of Satanists hanging around. And, uh, and uh, I did actually look into it quite a lot to get a, a perspective on where they're at. For me, being that I was in my 20s at the time, which is a difficult time for probably all of us, where you explore a lot of different possibilities because you're confused about a lot of life. You're just learning how to live. And uh, my take on, on the whole Satanism thing is just that, you know, when a young person wants to feel good about themselves, they want to feel like they're in control of things. And a lot of the whole Satanism idea revolves around magic. And uh, the whole idea with magic is, you know, if you believe it, then you feel all of a sudden that you have powers that you always wanted. You know, you, if you believe in magic, then you can control the universe just by thinking about it. Who doesn't want to hurt somebody that's hurt them by just willing it? I think it's a big kind of compulsion that's probably part of all of us. Almost like you're, you're in an, a role-playing situation where you are acting out in fantasy all the things you secretly would desire to do in, in the real world. Does that sound right? That's exactly it. Again, it's the whole wishing can make it so kind of thing that, that I think every little kid wants that. Well, I'm, I'm glad for your perspective, my friend. And, you know, right now you can be a high priest of the Church of Reality. How's that? That's a much more satisfying uh, position. Much more satisfying. Much more satisfying. I spent some time on the Church of Satan website, churchofsatan.com. I had two thoughts. My first thought is, you guys need a web designer. Big time. It is a text fest. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much web traffic they have, but it is a black backdrop. It's black text with a red stroke on it and then purple text way below it. And, and it's these huge mounds of text.
And the whole website's just really hard on the eyes. And I thought to myself, you know, I thought Satan was supposed to be awesome at marketing himself. You guys would be, trust me, you know, it's a little bit of investment. <laughs> just a little bit of investment and some marketing there for BL's Bub. And I think y'all are going to get some benefit out of that. And that's some free advice from me to you. OK, uh, the second thought was I was amazed at how much information there was there. And it led me to different uh, aspects and frequently asked questions. I actually got into the Beatitudes. I was able to find the Beatitudes from the book of Satan in chapter five. Now, I'm not going to read them all to you. But they are interesting. I'll, I'll just give you a few samples here. For example, blessed are the strong, for they shall possess the earth. Cursed are the weak, for they shall inherit the yoke. Blessed are the powerful, for they shall be reverenced among men. Cursed are the feeble, for they shall be blotted out. Blessed are the bold, for they shall be masters of the world. Cursed are the righteously humble, for they shall be trodden under cloven hoofs. It's a pretty hard line, you know, and I, I get some of it, but some of it does seem it's, it's pretty hard on the weak. It's pretty hard on the vulnerable. Well, let's find out more by going to the source and spending a few minutes with the high priest of the church of Satan. Peter H. Gilmore is an author. He is the uh, main administrator of the church of Satan, appointed high priest pardon me, appointed high priest uh, back in, was it 2001? He's been all over the place. He's been interviewed uh, on everything from History Channel, the BBC, sci-fi. Um, he's been on Bob Larson's Christian radio show. Uh, he's a musician, a trained composer. He has a very colorful background, and he joins me on the show today. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, I'm really a pleasure to be involved and an honor to be asked. Is... The Church of Satan, pretty secretive. Do you guys mostly keep to yourselves? Is it a secretive organization? Do you guys play it pretty close to the vest? Well, it depends on what it is about the organization that you're interested in. Our philosophy is quite open and easily obtainable. Uh, the literature has been out there ever since Anton LaVey wrote the Satanic Bible in 1969. And our website, churchofsatan.com, is really quite full of material so that everything that we're about is pretty much there for anybody who's curious to discover it. Now, uh, we don't talk much about membership figures and we don't reveal who's in the organization because membership is completely and utterly confidential with us, which means that there are people who could have very uh, high-profile public positions in the world who are affiliated, but uh, they keep secret uh, from everybody else who's even in the organization. The only people who would know would be uh, my wife, who's the high priestess, and myself. I came from the buckle of the Bible belt, a corn-fed Midwestern kid raised in Christian school, okay? So mm -hmm. when I'm I'm in school, I'm in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and of course, they're, they're spilling all of this religious dogma into our brains. Anytime the phrase, the term, the name, the moniker, the Church of Satan came up, it was always, they worship the devil. And <laughs> we freak out, oh my, oh my God, they worship Satan, which is common in the church. Don't bother to actually go any further and find out exactly what it is you guys are up to. But that's a common misnomer, right? That you guys actually worship an actual spirit, a supernatural entity named Satan or Beelzebub, right? Yes, that's a complete misconception. Satanism starts with atheism. We believe that the universe is utterly indifferent to us and that because we place ourselves as our highest value in our own self-created system of values, we consider ourselves our own gods. So at most, we could say we're self-deifiers, and uh, we reject the idea of, of anything supernatural. We don't believe in an afterlife. We don't believe in souls. We don't believe in demons or devils. Possession, of course, seems to be a psychological problem, not a supernatural one. And, uh, of course, it doesn't stop people from writing us almost every day asking how they can sell their soul to become rich, famous, and have sex with whoever they want. <laughs> they're, they're trying to cash in, huh? Well, yes. they're trying, but, you know, they, they're perpetual losers, and they're going to stay that way, I'm sure. Let's talk a little bit about the ritual, the tradition. Some people, you hear it every day, the accusation that it's theater, you guys are just being provocative, you're just trying to turn the screw. Why? so much harsh symbolism? Why so much shocking tradition? Why do this over just being, say, an atheist or a humanist? Well, in fact, we find that to be a lot of fun. Uh, our creator, Anton LaVey, was a man who was 
spent a good deal of his life in show business. He was in the carnival circuit. He did some circus work. He'd play calliope. He did lion taming. And uh, all religion is showbiz to one extent or another, and we're about the only one that admits that. But we enjoy that. Uh, metaphor and ritual is a hell of a good time. We think that actually a lot of folks who just want to be atheists and humanists get a little lost because they don't look at the human animal and, and really may see that, that these are aspects that are something that could be exercised to the benefit of the person rather than just be put aside. I remember that if you looked at American atheists under Madeleine Murray O'Hare, they were constantly trying to invent symbols for themselves and coming up with replacement rituals and such, because people kind of felt bereft, I think, uh, not having anything that they could do that, that they could use to reinforce their own values. Ayn Rand talked about uh, consciousness being conceptual and that you'd create metaphors out of a lot of percepts, you'd build up larger concepts, and that kind of idea that a symbol brings together so many different concepts all at one time. Symbolism is very powerful for the human animal. So we employ that, and we think we do it in a way that that's a lot of fun for people who have our kind of aesthetic. And we don't feel that it's something that everybody should be interested in. Uh, we, we tend to be kind of halloween -y sort of folk. And uh, it, again, it's, it's a good time for us, and that's really the, the best aspect of it. But outraging people is fun, too. All of these stuck-up religious folk who feel that they have the answer and that they're running around talking about some kind of great spiritual awakening after death. We just like to dump cold water on that and shock them and shake them up because, uh, you know, they're complacent. They think that they really do run the world. And we're showing them that there are other points of view and they can be dramatic and fun and engaging. I'm talking here with Peter H. Gilmore, the high priest of the Church of Satan. When I was in the church, I noticed that a lot of the churches would attract regular people, and they would also attract a lot of people who were just seeking attention. Do you find that the nature of the Church of Satan, you, you tend to attract a lot of people who are sort of rapping on your doors, who want to join up, who are simply looking to be provocative, they, they want to be able to tell people, people say, where do you go to church? And they could, of course, reply, I'm a member of the Church of Satan. Do you find people who are kind of the thrill seekers who want to be a part of that, and what do you do with them? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. We really don't get a lot of those kind of people. Uh, I think most folks who are thrill seekers and want attention can find plenty of ways of getting it on their own without having to say they're part of the Church of Satan. Because if they're in the Church of Satan, that kind of bad guy badge may not get them where they want to go. It could only really be a very brief thrill that could then backfire and not get them the kind of strokes that they're looking for. Most people want a good guy badge. They want to be seen as somebody to be emulated and, and honored and held up for esteem by the mass of society. What we, we do get, though, is that since people misinterpret what we're about, that we get the folks who are often the detritus coming to us, the losers who are saying, I want to sell my soul. I want you know Satan to make my life better because my life is crap. And being the Church of Satan, we can say, buzz off. We have no interest in you. This is an organization that tells you that you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You're entirely responsible for all of your actions, that your success and failure in life is on your shoulders, and you can't blame it on anybody else if you're a failure, and you don't need to tell anybody else that they're responsible for it if you do well. And that's a big challenge, and very few people are willing to live up to that, we found. So it, it ends up being a wonderful filter when they really find out what we're about, that uh, we're not here to embrace them in some kind of dark brotherhood and spirit them off you know, in a limousine with uh, you know, naked prostitutes to give them fun. Our attitude is that if your life is not wonderful, then it's your own fault, and get off your ass and make it good. Does the uh, Church of Satan have sins? I mean, can, uh, there's a lot of... I don't want to say, is it hedonistic? It's, you know, if, if it feels good, do it. If it tastes good, drink it, you know, <laughs> kind of, there's a lot of that going on, but there's, is there a moral code that you guys follow? Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, we would not say we're hedonistic. We're actually Epicurean because hedonism implies uncontrolled, rampant, uh, just going wherever you need to go. And, and that kind of being out of control of your life is something that Satanists oppose. We really feel that we have to be masters of ourselves. And that includes all the pleasures that we're going to be seeking. And the pleasures are one's choices. So, you know, I think some people think, well, if it's hedonist, then you have to be involved in orgies and gluttony and all these crazy things and, and push yourself in areas that you don't want to go. And the whole point is for Satanism, since it's a philosophy of individualism, that it's your own choice. You have to decide what's good for you in your life. 
Now, we do have sins, but our idea of sins, they're behaviors that we want to limit, to get out of our lives. They're things that we find negative, things that we might do. And since we're always about trying to improve ourselves and, and uh, be the best ourselves that we can be, the satanic sins are, are a little more interesting than most religions, because they're not something that some god is telling you not to do. These are things that we tell ourselves, hey, we don't really want these to be part of our lives. And uh, the number one satanic sin is stupidity. And uh, we really don't want to behave like idiots. You know, if you're ignorant, of course, you know, you can always ameliorate that by doing some research. But we kind of find that uh, our society thrives on stupidity these days, that uh, everybody's out there trying to take advantage of folks just being a bunch of dumb sheep. And we oppose that for ourselves. I mean, if other people are stupid sheep and folks want to take advantage of them, fine. It's not our business to save them. We're not out here to save anybody. The second satanic sin is pretentiousness. And we find that, that if you're posturing, if you're a bragger, unless you can really deliver the goods, then shut up. We don't want to hear that nonsense. Uh, you know, be honest about what you actually can do. And we Satanists are really very strict self-critics. We try to find out what our talents are and develop them. And really, we are, are often quite ruthless with uh, rejecting things that we do as not being good enough and, and really trying to pull ourselves up and, and make ourselves productive. That's, that's one of our values. A third sin is solipsism, and, and that's, for us, it's not the classic philosophical idea of solipsism. We sort of mean that it's the idea of projecting yourself and your values on others without really investigating what they're about. And that's dangerous, because if you think other people have the same kind of values that you do and you find out that they don't, which they, generally speaking, often wouldn't, uh, you could really run afoul of, of being taken advantage of. Self-deceit is another one of our sins, and we really think that you shouldn't fool yourselves. You really have to be honest about yourself. The self is, is our deity, so no self-deceit here. The next one will be herd conformity. And for the Satanists, that means just following along with what everybody else is doing just because they're doing it. And we think, again, that's sheep-like behavior. That's a form of stupidity, but in a social manner. And we would not want to do that. I mean, you could go along with what other people are doing if you can find a specific advantage to it for you. Like, hey, there's a, there's a great device out there. Let's say oh, the iPhone 5 is a wonderful phone. A lot of people are buying it. You could buy it. That's not herd conformity. That's just finding something that's valuable. And if everybody else went along with that because it is a good thing for you, then that's fine. But don't simply go along with things that might be against your values just because everybody else is doing it. You also think that uh, lack of perspective is something that we consider a bad behavior. And that would mean lack of perspective and, and context for almost any kind of action in your life. We really feel as Satanists that it's kind of our responsibility to understand a bit of history and a great deal about human behavior so that we, again, can be effective in whatever we're approaching, whatever our goals are. And along those lines, the idea of forgetting about past orthodoxies, we also consider a sin. Because when you watch trends that rise and fall in society, often in arts and literature and music, Whenever something rises and then falls, then when it comes again, everybody acts, it's like the first time it's ever happened. And we think, well, just pay attention to what's gone on before you. And you won't be hoodwinked by somebody offering you really some kind of stale old thing in a new package. One of our major things that we want to avoid is counterproductive pride. Pride is good because we feel that we have to value ourselves first before we can value anything else. If you're your own God, you can then be a benevolent God and value other people and other things. But if you're too prideful, you're really throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And, and again, that uh, can go back to the pretentiousness. Those kind of reflect on each other. They're behaviors that are, are tandem bad things that we try to avoid. And our last sin would be the lack of aesthetics. And Satanism, which what makes us really more a religion than a philosophy, is that we do have an aesthetic sense, that we do have symbols and metaphors that we embrace and employ. And we feel that understanding the aesthetics of cultures, architectural, uh, musical aesthetics, literary aesthetics, uh, just the balance and structure of how anything is created, learning what uh, principles are out there. You know, the golden mean in architecture is a good one to even understand. The sense of proportion and balance. Uh, being able to know that is, uh, we think, an enriching thing. So as Satanists, we, we encourage having an aesthetic sense. And so we really denigrate the idea of people who actually have none whatsoever. Talking here with Peter H. Gilmore, High Priest of the Church of Satan. Now, I've had some fun with this. Obviously, in my own mind, I'm, 
I'm always conjuring, you know, the organ. I, in fact, I, I saw some YouTube video of LeVay himself who's sitting in front of the organ, you know, and he's totally playing it up and, and the dark arts and the symbolism and it just, and especially during this time of year. And as we approach the Halloween holiday, there are people in my former community, the Christian community and other faiths who are going to be locking up their black cats and hiding their virgin daughters because they are convinced that members of your organization are going to go out and kidnap the animals and the children for sacrifice. And I want you to speak to this. Sure. Well, first of all, we love animals because we feel humans are animals just like all the rest. We don't make any distinction between humans and other animals. We feel kinship with them. Now, the idea of sacrificing, uh, Anton LaVey addressed that really directly in his book, The Satanic Bible. And we always have to point out, it's right there at the top of page 89, and it says, under no circumstances would a Satanist sacrifice any animal or baby. It couldn't be clear. And the whole point is, uh, you know, animals, we, we find, follow their natures. Humans are about the only animal that can contradict their own nature. So Satanists value animals. And children are, are a potential. They have a potential to be allowed to follow their nature as they grow, rather than have it stunted, as so often the Christians and other spiritual religions will do. The spiritual religions have seemed to feel that whatever you do naturally is something bad. And it's just this wonderful game and, and really con game that they do by saying anything that you feel that you want to do is evil. And since you're going to keep doing it because it's natural for you and they say it's evil, you have to go to them for forgiveness if you want to get into their heaven. So they trap you all, anybody who believes in those spiritual religions, into being subject to bowing down and asking forgiveness and being transformed so they can reach this mythical heaven that they keep trying to offer you. So the bleeding of your blood into a cup and drinking it, does that kind of stuff exist? No, no. We're, we're actually not interested in, in that kind of unhealthy behavior. Okay. Well, there are a lot of off shoots. And as I was preparing the show, I received correspondence from a number of different, uh, do I call them splinters? Do I call them copycats? And they, they are a little darker or they do something different or they condone violence or, or who knows. What is the official Church of Satan stance on all of these other organizations that sort of borrow from your name? Well, we consider them pseudo-Satanists because most of those people are essentially devil worshipers. They do believe in the Christian God, and they do believe in the Christian devil, and they've decided to opt to worship the loser in that mythology. And we think it's foolish to believe in either of those mythical figures. Theism is to us a poison. It's an evil. It's something that has caused grief for as long as human history has been recorded. And uh, those folks, if they're claiming they're the Church of Satan, they're liars. And uh, since we actually have trademarked our... <laughs> Our organizations, you know, various aspects of it, you know, they could be legally sued for that. Uh, most of, I, I really haven't seen anybody else claiming to be us or use our names, but there's a lot of crap on the internet where there's these nutty devil worshiping types. And actually, I think for the most part, it's like a handful of kids or just idiots with a website. They're looking for attention and they get it because they say all these things. But if you look at them, they're probably living in their mom's basement, going to a job, if they even have a job, you know, that's really low level, that they're probably close to being fired from. Yeah. They're, they're, again, like societal rejects and losers. And this is their way of trying to get people to pay attention to them. Folks like that are generally really of no consequence, unless they're the type who are inclined to actual criminal activity. And since uh, the Church of Satan's philosophy is one of law and order and supporting the idea of a social contract, we uh, do not look well upon people who do criminal acts and think they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. For you, Satan epitomizes the pleasures of the flesh, the enjoyments that religion would normally forbid. Satan is sort of your way of tweaking the church, right? That's close. But Satan more to us is, is an inspirational figure, like he was to Mark Twain or Byron or Milton, as a symbol of pride and individualism and liberty. Uh, we're not really using it just as a way of, of being negative and contrary to Christian or other spiritual religions. I mean, because we, we don't embrace any spiritual religion at all. We think they're all equally foolish. Uh, so for us, there's this great feeling of of, of pride that we are individuals and that we can celebrate that. And you guys take a harder line than a lot. I mean, you, you don't believe in turning the other cheek. 
No, not at you know, all. You don't put up with any shit. Is that what you're saying? I mean, precisely. We don't think anybody should really. Uh, you know, how else should you live? I mean, do, should you be a sheep? Should you bow down? Like, we're against tyranny. We're against subservience. Uh, we're out there to try to promote the idea that people should be self-directed. But again, we understand that that there's a range of abilities in the human species, and that it's not for everybody. Not everybody can form their own horizons, as Nietzsche would ask for the Superman to do. He only felt that a Superman could do that. We think that that may be an exaggeration, but sometimes when you see the mass of people out there and how clone-like they behave, then perhaps he's right, that you really have to be a Superman to do that, and that the percentage of folks who can direct themselves is very small, a very tiny little capstone to a very big pyramid. Uh, but, uh, you know, the funny thing, too, though, is that there was a point called the Satanic Panic from the late 80s through the 90s when evangelical Christians were putting up people who were claiming to have been part of some kind of diabolical organization that was doing just exactly what your church taught you, that there was babies being bred for sacrifice and animals yeah. being slaughtered and that you know demons were teleporting people. It was during that very time period as well. It was the mid to late 80s and early 90s, you betcha. Yeah, and we call that the Satanic Panic. And it was really, if you've ever read uh, Harold Brunvon's books about urban legends, all that kind of stuff was spread in in the techniques he has basically described in his books about how urban legends begin and are promulgated. So uh, Geraldo Rivera was actually probably the worst person responsible for, for keeping that nonsense going. And uh, they were just crazy folks, even some who were part of law enforcement, who would go around saying, yes, yes, this is indeed going on. And they'd often have books that they were trying to promote, or they'd be offering themselves as consultants to other law enforcement around the country, and they'd charge people a fortune. They'd say, they'd go to, say, a small police department and say, I'm an expert in a cold crime, and uh, here, char I'll charge you $300 a head for each of the officers in your uh, you know, local force. And then they'd bring in crap that they bought in some occult store and claim that it was at some scene of some murder. And it was all nonsense. And, and at that point, I was often doing television shows sitting alongside these people and exposing them for the liars and frauds that they are. And there'd be, of course, people in the audience who were religious going, well, I believe that. And I'd say, well, you know, there's this book called The Satan Seller by this guy who claims to have been a drug addict. And he says that demons teleported him to places. And I said, you believe that nonsense? And, and they're like, yes, I do, because he's a good man. And I'm like thinking, mm hmm. Well, then I have no hope to reach somebody like that. If people believe in irrationality, you really have no way to, to go to try to get them to deal with reality as it is. And I'm sure you feel the same way as an atheist, that when you, you talk to people and you try to bring up the mythology of their beliefs or the very fact that their theism demands that they condemn huge swaths of the human species who aren't fellow believers, that uh, they have to move away from that, that secularism would be a better way. But uh, you can't really bash through that with some folks. They're a lost cause. I have to bring to attention that Mike Warnke, the author of The Satan Seller, was exposed as a complete fraud. He had never spent any time as a Satanist high priest. He was never a drug user. He wasn't in the Vietnam War. He hadn't done any of the things that he said he was going to do, and he was exposed by someone inside the Christian faith, and it was a huge scandal at the time. Yeah, yeah. I've got all those articles. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, an, just watching another domino fall, huh? Yeah, well, the funny thing is he tried to be a Christian comedian after that and then offer marriage counseling. But since he had had about six different marriages, yeah, he's yeah. really hardly the one to go to for advice because it clearly wasn't working for him. If we could put a big scarlet bow on everything, the Church of Satan is what? Well, the Church of Satan is a religion and a philosophy that basically stands for the value of human individualism, pride, and liberty. That's our essence, and that we do it in a theatrical way because we have fun that way. Life should be fun. We think life is a great party. We'd like to be alive as long as possible. We like to explore the mysteries that are there. We don't lock ourselves off from uh, thinking that we know everything already. We constantly question all things. And faith is not a part of Satanism. We reject faith as simply, again, being sheep-like behavior. So doubt is the tool that we use to question all things, and reason is the tool we use to explore whatever data we can amass to really come to understand our position in the universe and generally enjoy every minute that we're alive if we can possibly do that. And I'll bet you guys have one 
hell of a Halloween party. Sure. What we well actually most interesting is the highest holiday in Satanism is each Satanist's own birthday. That's how self-centered we are. But uh, Halloween for us is a lot of fun. We tend to look and see that most people are trying to act like Satanists one night of the year, and that's the one. They want to reach down and sort of touch their dark side or wear costumes that reveal parts of themselves that they've been repressing the other 364 days a year. But, uh, we, you know, we give out candy. I have a big Victorian house in upstate New York. And it looks like the Adams Family House, and it's painted black with uh, red and purple and copper trim details. And uh, another friend of mine lives down the block and has what he calls the Halloween House, and it's sort of green and orange and black, and he has sort of Halloween decor up year-long, very spooky stuff. So we give out candy to the kids. There's not a lot of people who do that anymore. Of course, the kids with costumes get more, and the kids with spooky costumes get the best candy of all. We've had a strolling violinist going back and forth between the houses, dressed and tie and tails playing sort of uh, classical music that is spooky. We had somebody who's a, an extraordinary a mute clown that would chase people around because just about everybody is terrified of clowns. And uh, we have a lot of fun. It's, it's really a great deal of fun. And uh, after the children and the candy is over with, we'll go inside and generally imbibe wonderful spirits and have carefully crafted cocktails with homemade ingredients <laughs> and a, a lot of conviviality with intelligent and wonderful people. And we think that's a great way to spend that evening. <laughs> the Church of Satan makes more sense than the Christian church that I was raised in. I mean, if I believed in hell, it would be frozen. Fantastic. <laughs> Peter H. Gilmore, High Priest of the Church of Satan. I hope you and yours have a happy Halloween. And you too, Seth, have an absolutely thrilling Halloween and, and the rest of the year may it bring you an abundance of pleasure and joy. Thank you very, very much. There's a, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of parallels to atheism, non-theism, you know? <laughs> I mean, we don't have the theater. I, I don't think we're as married to the self necessarily. I mean, atheists run the gamut, obviously. But, but when I was growing up, we were taught that Satanists worship the spirit, the demon, the devil, the dark entity, the enemy of Jehovah and Jesus, Beelzebub himself. And going back to the early days of when LeVay actually started it, I mean, there's some, you know, they do some, I, I guess they've got some rituals, some curses and whatnot that are supposed to be symbolic and empower you and all out of that stuff. You know, and it ain't my scene. <laughs> I was telling, I was telling uh, Natalie about the fact that I was researching the show and like kind of learning a little bit this week. And she, you know, she's already been with me from, uh, you know, she's already seen the, from a distance, kind of the the uh, the Christian to ambivalent, and then she saw up close the ambivalent to I'm an atheist, and she's like, oh hell no, you're not gonna be a Satanist. <laughs> No, it's not my point. I don't want to. It's not what I. No, it's not what I'm saying. She's. Like, I'm out on that. I'm not. I'm not doing it. But uh, but it is amazing to me. It seems to be kind of a uh, just a tweak to th all churches, all denominations, all theistic entities out there. And not only are we going to be the very epitome of the thing that that you are afraid of and preach against. But we're going to have a hell of a time doing it. It seems like just this this big middle finger to the church. <laughs> Maybe that's what he had in mind all along. I had an email from James. He said this. He said, first off, I consider all isms to be bullshit. Took me a long time to embrace atheism for that reason. Logic and empathy should drive our views. We will never get rid of guns, religion, and drugs. They just need to be kept out of the hands of the nuts. People think if we ban something, it will disappear. Ban guns, drugs, gays, then they will all disappear. When people adopt an ism, they are told they will have to buy into all or nothing. This has and will never work. Isms are half nonsense, half ideology, half opinion, half superstition, and half based in good intention. All politicians are full of crap. We're left with the lesser evil. I'm a Democrat for the same reason I'm an atheist. It's the only thing that currently makes sense. I'm not sure how much more you could cram into one paragraph, James. Uh, so anything with an ism, 
you totally reject. April sent a message and said, I have been a member of the Church of Satan for almost a decade and have identified as a Satanist for about 13 years. I've been a Church of Satan witch, an elevation and title within the Church of Satan since 2006. Professionally, I am a high school science teacher, a profession that many would consider very unlikely for a Satanist. As such, any interview or perspective offered would be tantalizing, but anonymous, of course, she was talking about maybe being interviewed for the show. I'm so deep in the Bible belt that separation of church and state is in practice disregarded to the point it would be a professional liability to be known as an atheist. And that being the case, it'd be career suicide for my affiliation with the Church of Satan to be known Unfortunately, too many atheists and agnostics persist in thinking Satanists are not atheists due to our use of, quote, greater magic. Yet this conclusion of the atheist and agnostic community derives from a very different definition than the one that Satanists employ. Essentially, humans have co-evolved with religion in its various forms for thousands of years. Even though prayer has no impact on the external physical world of the practitioner of religion, it is known to have real psychological, physiological impacts on the person who is praying, much the way a placebo can have a physiological impact on patients. The act of prayer, much like positive thinking, can mold and change the interworkings of our neurons in ways that scientists still do not fully comprehend. Yet the power of suggestion is documented so widely that it is standard practice to measure the effectiveness of new medication against a placebo in a double-blind study. The difference between Satanists and atheists is that Satanists see no need to throw out this useful tool that our brains seem to be hardwired to harness. Instead, Satanists allow the optional practice of magic, which is not, uh, which is not a requirement to be a Satanist, so intentionally, skillfully, and willfully refocus our own brains in accordance with our own ambitions and aspirations. As Satanists, we can use the powerful tools of ritual and imagery cultivated by religion in the absence of any recognition of an external deity to exploit the power of prayer or meditation to influence our own brain chemistry in the way the same mysterious ways that religious employ. In this way, Satanists benefit from the cathartic release and positive emotional boost that many religious people gain from their delusion, but we receive these benefits without the manipulation of religious institutions or the delusion of a deity. Thank you so much for the message. LeVay himself talked about using Satan, taking what the church fears the most and sticking that symbol right back in its face. The great devil's advocates of the past, Friedrich Nietzsche, Mark Twain, Herbert Spencer, H.G. Wells, Shaw, Pierce, all of them, they were able to hold a looking glass up to man, but man momentarily viewing his self-deceit upon reading the works of these people, could quickly avert his gaze and find solace in his spurious rule books. The time for an organization of devils was not yet ready when these devil's advocates existed. For only a strong organized movement could force the mirror of self-revealing before the world's eyes and hold it there. And this is what we wish to do. Hold that mirror up. From chapter 3 of the Book of Satan, it says, Love one another, it has been said, is the supreme law. But what power made it so? Upon what rational authority does the gospel of love rest? Why should I not hate mine enemies? If I love them, does that not place me at their mercy? Is it natural for enemies to do good unto each other? And what is good? Can the torn and bloody victim love the blood-splashed jaws that rend him limb from limb? Are we not all predatory animals by instinct? If humans ceased wholly from preying upon each other, could they continue to exist? Is not lust and carnal desire a more truthful term to describe love when applied to the continuance of the race? Is not the love of the fawning scripture simply a euphemism for sexual activity, or was the great teacher a glorifier of eunuchs. Love your enemies and do good to them that hate you and use you. Is this not the despicable philosophy of the spaniel that rolls upon its back when kicked? Hate your enemies with a whole heart 
And if a man smite you on one cheek, smash him on the other. Smite him hip and thigh, for self-preservation is the highest law. He who turns the other cheek is a cowardly dog. Give blow for blow, scorn for scorn, doom for doom, with compound interest liberally added thereunto, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, eye fourfold, a hundredfold. Make yourself a terror to your adversary. And when he goeth his way, he will possess much additional wisdom to ruminate over. This shall you make yourself respected in all the walks of life, and your spirit, your immortal spirit, shall live not in an intangible paradise, but in the brains and sinews of those whose respect you have gained. Wow. <laughs> and back to the switchboard. Thanks for calling the uh, Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. What's your name? Uh, my name is Shane Bugby. Are you currently a member of the Church of Satan, or have you been? What's your story? I have been. I was a friend of Anton LaVey's. I, I don't know if I would consider myself a member, but I think they do, yes. All right, you, you actually, because a lot of people say that. Oh, yeah, Anton LaVey and I, we knew each other. But you guys, you were actually friends? Well, yeah, I did a book with He did an introduction for a book that I did, and I, I've done an interview, and yeah, I did know him, yeah, for sure. All right, so... First of all, he's not the monster that they taught us that he was as kids. You can see the wink in his eye. You can see him tweaking everybody who's all freaked out. He is reveling in it. He knows it's theater. Yeah, when I was involved with him, I took it as an artistic and political movement, not as a religion. That's how I took it. I took it as something to act out against organized religion. A Satanist is a person who can't be stuck to the wall. You can't really define them. So his take on it, is a little maybe a little different than my own take or another Satanist take on it. It's just about individual free will. So why be Satanist instead of, say, atheist, agnostic, humanist, rationalist, whatever? Why Satanism? I guess uh, why be a Black Panther versus being an activist for other things? It's, it was part of the the zeitgeist of the time. It was part of being a uh, part of being a, on the world stage, the theater of the absurd. Uh, that's how I saw it. Did you, know, you tell people I'm a member of, well, you, did, you said you weren't necessarily a member, but did I you would say? If they, I would if they were Christian, yeah. I would, if someone was <laughs> are you a Satanist, I would say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Satanist. But if I'm talking to atheists, no, I'm an atheist. That's what I would define myself in, in today's social standards. I'm an atheist. So has that happened? Some clean cut, fresh faced believer walks up and asks you where to go to church and. Dude, I was run out of a town. For stuff, being friends of Anton LaVey, like literally run out of a town, shunned and run out of a town. So has that happened? Yeah. And when I tried to explain myself to people, there's not a lot of explaining when you decide as a young metalhead to go once in a while, yeah, I'm a Satanist. <laughs> you know, the internet sort of caught up with that kind of 70s type of stuff where, you know, my, my stuff was on the internet. So it's like, um, how do I explain to this small town in Minnesota that, well, I'm an atheist, uh, but I say I'm a Satanist for artistic and political expression because I really find religion to be a drag on humanity. Do you think Satanism sort of attracts the people who like the shock value? They like dressing up in, in all black and the blood red and the theater and, and all of they They enjoy telling people that they are a member of the Church of Satan. Do you think they get a kick and that's why they do it instead of just being a rationalist? Unfortunately, now I think it, it does attract stuff like that. Before, I like the old uh, COS stuff was really, um, boy, it was really strong. It was really strong with artists and philosophers really just trying to get together. It was really a think tank. Now it has become attractive to people who are being abused or picked out in high school and need theatrics that will scare people away. You know, and that's how a lot of that has become, yeah. Is there an actual church, like a facility, or is it more like people join, but they are these members in their own circle and they just sort of have the membership card? Is there a, like a building, a church of Satan? Well, no, there's not. Like, it, it's just basically a philosophical pursuit. And like with any philosophy, once it uh, is practiced, it sort of becomes a religion. But, you know, philosophies are meant to be added to, I think, you know. Are you no longer a member? Or is that for a particular reason? Yeah, I do not enjoy Peter Gilmore. <laughs> really? So you stand far apart from him and 
his particular organization in its current form. Do you want to speak to that? Well, yeah, I am at odds with that stuff. I am at odds with him and uh, his 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 version of the the Church of Satan. Like, it's really become a religion where people practice what they believe. Levey's individual beliefs they practice as law, and that is not part of the artistic and political movement that I was involved in. Again, like I said, philosophy is meant to be built on. And that's what I thought was beautiful about what LeVay was doing, was he was letting people like myself build on it and explore that kind of stuff rather than practicing rules. There, there are no rules to your existence on this earth. You know, they're, they're man, you know, man-made rules. And so I just don't agree with how Peter runs things. He's looking to sell T-shirts now. Did I hear you say you'd written a book? Was it on the subject of the Church of Satan? It is a a big part of that book. Like I said, I got run out of a town for being a Satanist publicly. Now, what does that mean? You lost a job. They protested (laughs) in front of your house. What does run out of town mean? What that means, it's really a harsh situation. You laugh at it first, and it's fun when you walk into the small town grocery store. This is a town of 2,000 people in the middle of the woods. And it's sort of funny when you walk in there and the whole grocery store goes silent. Me and my wife enjoyed that part of it. And then it got progressively worse and worse where we started to get death threats. And then our landlord came over one night and said, you know, you guys really have to leave by the end of the week. Um, Then we had our friend that was an American Indian come to us and say, you guys really have to leave. There's something really bad going to happen. And, um, you know, I had my wife come home in tears and shit like that. It's really not an easy situation to go through. We literally had to leave in the middle of the night. We left most of our stuff behind, and it was not easy. It was just, it was, it was not, uh, the months leading up to that were brutal. Uh, I could not believe that people were like that. You know, I, I really always thought that freedom of expression and communication was, existed, uh, uh, you know, and um, that really knocked the shit out of my idealistic youth. You got me curious real quick about the book. Is, is it available? Is there, can I lead my people that way if they want to check it out? Oh, yeah. USAodd.com has the information. It's called The Suffering and Celebration of Life in America. And it comes with a film as well. It has a, it's a multimedia type of expression. It's a 531-page book and a 80-minute film. Thanks for the input and for your perspective. Much appreciated. And, and we'll see what everybody else has to say about it, okay? Well, thank you so much. We'll try to get as many of your calls and emails into the final minutes of the show as we continue talking about Satanism, especially... Levian Satanism. It has been said that the most powerful thing in the world is an idea whose time has come round. The idea that the enemy might conceivably have something worthwhile to say is now with us. In fact, is that demon within each of us really an enemy, as we have so long been taught? Or will it be recognized as the guiding spirit of enlightenment that it really is? We must remember the word demon does not imply evil, but simply a guiding spirit, a motivating spirit. Anybody else look at photographs of LeVay and immediately think of Ming the Merciless from Flash Gordon? Google it. Look at the photographs side by side and tell me they're not brothers. (laughs) Tell me I'm not crazy. 704, thanks for waiting on me. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's your name? Uh, Zach. Zach, thanks for waiting. What's up? Um, well, my, I, my school, there's a Bible class, and I went to the website of our school for teachers. I went to her university website to check out, you know, her background. And on her university website, university being used lightly, um, she had a, there was a story about a Satanist, supposedly. I don't think the story's true. And it's like um, a kid walked into her Bible class, said, I worship Satan and I serve him, blah, blah, blah. And then he was suddenly converted like three weeks later. Okay, so let me make sure I'm tracking. You went to the website that was posted by a teacher at your university? No. All right, I'm a high school student. Okay. And my teacher has a... My, she has a, there's a Bible class at my school for some reason. It's an elective. And then I went on their website, the 
her website on the school website. I see. And she said something about how a Satanist went in, proclaimed that he was part of the Church of Satan, and became a convert a few weeks later. And the whole thing sounds contrived to you. Is that close? Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for waiting. Take care of yourself. I love your show and uh, videos. Appreciate that very, very much. I appreciate you listening today. Take care of yourself. Yeah, thank you. Oh, 619, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, this is uh, Zach Black. How are you doing? What's going on, Zach? What's your perspective on the Church of Satan? Well, I, you know, I think I have a unique uh, perspective because I was a member of the Church of Satan from 1994 till 2010 when I resigned. So uh, I had some questions for Gilmore, but since he's gone, I just wanted to state a, a few criticisms against the Church of Satan. Yeah, we'll make them rhetorical uh, one, questions. Go ahead. Hit me. Okay. Okay, cool, cool. One, the Church of Satan is basically a defunct organization. And as you mentioned, I heard you mention that their website looks like it was written on uh, Windows 98. <laughs> well, that's pretty much when the Church of Satan died, was with Anton LaVey. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got nothing against Peter Gilmore, but if truth be known, uh, Peter Gilmore is not handpicked by Anton LaVey to be the, the high priest of the Church of Satan. It was actually Boyd Rice. And Boyd Rice declined it, and Peter Gilmore was given the high priesthood of the Church of Satan by Anton LaVey's lover and inherited, or inheritance of the Church of Satan, Blanche Barton, as a gesture of respect for his financial support when Anton LaVey died, and you know Gilmore helped support her to get back on her feet. Hey, Zach, do you so, think that there's like a cult of personality thing going on? I mean, do you think the church really died when LeVay died because he was such a figurehead? He was sort of the franchise player. He was the face and the voice of the Church of Satan. Do you think his passing sort of spelled the death knell for it or what? Absolutely. Absolutely. LeVay was very charismatic, very uh, intelligent man. And uh, Peter Gilmore is kind of a shadow of that. Uh, you know, nothing against Gilmore, but uh, I thought it would be just a, really a, a pleasant thing. guy. I thought it was an, a, a very just. A, I mean, I, if you were to tell me ten years ago, I'd be interviewing the high priest of the Church of Satan, and I would have a good time. I would have, you know, I'd be seeing how hard you were hitting the, the you know, the mescaline. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, what? <laughs> oh, are you kidding? But I mean, I found the guy to be completely pleasant. I don't know anything about him or the organization outside of that conversation. But I, I did have the thought that I still, at this moment here in 2012, think of LeVay when I think of the Church of Satan. And I wonder if LeVay being gone has really sort of diminished the overall presence of the organization. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, the LeVay died in 97 and the first few years after 97, uh, there was an administrative thumb wrestling match to try to restructure the hierarchy of the Church of Satan. And what really killed the Church of Satan, though, wasn't Peter Gilmore. It was the Internet, because the majority of people who were joining the Church of Satan before the Internet were to meet like-minded individuals. And when the Internet came along, uh, no longer is, there, is it necessary to spend $200 on a membership fee to meet like-minded individuals. You can just log on to this side or that side, you know. What were you like in the church? Did you participate in ritual? Did you have the sword? Did you have the naked woman on the altar? Did you have the organ music and the, I mean, did you participate in the theatrics? Actually, uh, that's kind of a misconception. There are very few people that actually participate and have what they call, well, well what they call now, it wasn't called this back then, but they call now active membership. Dude, you're I killing me. An active member. You're stealing. You're no, stealing I'm my serious. joy here. Uh, I have a mental <laughs> image of the Church of Satan, oh. and there's Gothic temples and huge pipe organs and and virgins. And you're killing me now. You're sucking it all. You're saying it's sort of benign and, and dull in, in in the big picture. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. I mean, they, yeah. they do that for theatrics and, and when, they, when they're on, you know, uh, media. But, uh, well, you know, if you want to talk about gothic black rooms and rituals, I did uh, in my youth paint my room black and uh, hang bath mitts and upside down crosses and uh, had sex with many goth women. But, you know, that's kind of part of the church of Satan. That was just, you know, my own. Save uh, that one for the autobiography, my friend. You bet. <laughs> So right. you left, right. why'd you wait so long to walk if LeVay died in 97, you left the church in 2010? Is, did I hear that right? Why wait? Uh, the reason why I waited was just because, well, 
first of all, I'll have to say that when I did join the Church of Satan, they sent me a um, like a 50-question psychological questionnaire ranging all kinds of questions from, like, what's your favorite color to, if you had three wishes, what would they be, describe Satan to you, yada, yada. Fill that shit out. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, fill that out and uh, mail the pictures. They asked for pictures of yourself. And then they mailed something back and said, oh, you look like you can articulate the tenets and foundations and philosophy of Satanism. Well, so uh, if you would like further involvement, please send a VHS copy. This is before CD and DVD and all that stuff. I'm kind of old, copy. you know. <laughs> so, and uh, I, I, I didn't. I was delivering pizzas when I was 18, so I didn't have, you know, money to spend on a thousand dollar camcorder. Whatever. What they want? To, what they uh, want to tape of you? What are you do? It's like sounds like an, an old dating site. I mean, are you having to do an audition, <laughs> an interview on tape for these guys? Basically, basically, yes. And uh, I said, thank you, but no thank you. And, uh, you know, I actually did talk to Gilmore, Peter Gilmore, once uh, through snail mail um, when the Anton LaVey died at a subscription to a publication called The Cloven Hoof and the Black Flame that Gilmore uh, was the, at the time he was the administrator for. And uh, I never received my, my copies, and I wrote him a letter, and he basically told me in a polite way to, you know, go F off. So <laughs> that was my last communication with Gilmore. <laughs> Granted, this was a long time ago. Maybe maybe his attitude is a little different now. But, yeah. Uh, well, but, no, you know, th th there was no real active involvement. Like, you know, there was a handful of people that, that gravitate around Mr. Gilmore. And what I want to make clear here is that the majority of Satanists are not members of the Church of Satan. You know, granted, there are Satanists in the Church of Satan, but the majority are not the Church of Satan. And the Church of Satan wants you to believe that you can only be a member of the, or you can only be a real Satanist. And they, they, they stress that real Satanist if you pay the $200 membership fee and you get your little fancy red card. So. So are all these offshoots just, I mean, uh, come on. I mean, are they just kids in their basement trying to be cool? Are they attention getters? Are they... Are they legitimate organizations? Uh, Probably all the above, majority, right? Yeah, yeah, all the above, all the above. Um, you know, Satanism is not a religion, it's a philosophy. And I don't think the word church should have anything to do in the same sentence or paragraph with the term Satan. Satan is nothing but the adversary. And Satanism is the adversary. Ism is being put into action. Okay? And... There are people capitalizing on this. There are death metal fans that dress like Marilyn Manson and piss off their parents, you know. The, you have, you know, just like Christians. I mean, you know, you look at Christianity. Uh, Jim Jones, you know, the, the mass, mass murderer, uh, he considered himself a Christian. And he was, I think, a, a pat, you know, he, was, he had some sort of title in the church, but uh, he ended up killing 90 people or whatever, or however many people, you know. <laughs> It's, that doesn't necessarily reflect on all of Christianity, just like Satanism. I mean, there there are kooks, there are cool people. It's just a, a cornucopia of uh, nuttiness. Are you so? I I get the vibe they just attract some of the more theatrical, some of the more flamboyant, some of the people who just they have the kind of personality where they want their lives to have more, for lack of a better word, theater in it, and they choose this way of expressing their own lack of a belief in a deity and more of a personal responsibility to, as Peter said himself, pull people up, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and own it. I mean, is that, do you think that's close? I do think that's close, and it's been a very common criticism uh, against Satanists. Um, Satanists are nothing but atheists in Halloween costumes. <laughs> That's and, uh, a great line. <laughs> That's a great it? line. I wish I could. I wish I could have coined that, but I, I didn't. I didn't say that. But no, that, that, that's a very common criticism. In Halloween, in Halloween costumes. costumes. Yeah. Well, they've certainly <laughs> given us uh, some uh, good discussion. Anything else before I move on? Uh, you know, no. That that's good. I'm I'm glad that uh, Peter Gilmore came out of his hole and decided to do an interview and uh, actually do something for once. But yeah, I, I, I've enjoyed listening. All Thank right, you very thanks much. for the call. I do appreciate it. Man, anybody Anything. else feel the temperature in the room drop about twenty degrees right there? Ooh, man. Anybody else chilly? <laughs> it's interesting what he said about having to uh, record a video audition and send it into the Church of Satan. I just picture that you get sort of your membership packet 
in the mail. You know, oh, look, look, honey, you got a package in from the Church of Satan. And you open it up and, you know, there's the upside down cross in it and some hand carved devil horns and some death metal on vinyl and a little handy uh, Beelzebub patch you can sew on your on your shoulder and just <laughs> just keep the devil with you everywhere you go. Uh, I've got time for one more before I uh, finish up with an email here. Let's talk to 310. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth, this is David. David, thanks for waiting on me. Appreciate you being on hold for so long. What do you think? Uh, this has been a great um, uh, broadcast. Uh, this is actually the first time I was able to call into your show, and I just wanted to thank you for for um, being there to, to uh, support me through my transition because I come, came from a very similar background as yourself. And I actually dated a witch once that uh, actually uh, thought of the uh, Satanist at work as being the antithesis of, uh, of Wicca. And uh, so it was, it was just kind of interesting just hearing the, the, um, the fact that they are basically just atheists. I've had some requests to do some shows about Wicca, and, and I am ill-equipped to, to do it, just like I was ill-equipped to do The Church of Satan. So we'll probably cover it, but I'm going to have to lean on the experiences and knowledge of others. It's something that I, I simply don't know much about. Did you ever practice any sort of uh, dark art or Satanism or, or do anything provocative along those lines? I dabbled in Wicca through my transition out of Christianity. What was your background it was, in Christianity? It was, it, was it like, were you a conservative, like a Baptist? Were you a Assembly of God, Pentecostal, Catholic? What was your background? I well, I'm I'm a preacher's kid. I uh, is a Southern Baptist minister and extremely fundamentalist um, Tea Party family, and I, I'm I'm the odd duck. So, <laughs> I would guess is your father still with us? Is he still around? Uh, well, it's a, it's strange you should say that. I just got a message actually through Facebook from my sister that. That he is quickly declining. Everything is his system is shutting down. He's been dealing with Parkinson's for quite a few years, and he's losing a lot of weight. And he's probably not going to make it out through the through the month. I'm really sorry, man. I'm really sorry to hear that. And it's probably been a tough road because did they had they known your parents known that you walked away from the beliefs that they taught you? Uh, they, I think everyone in my family kind of got the idea because I wasn't—I was never really a church goer. I wasn't really one to uh, appreciate being preached to. I thought that the um, spirit, the the path was supposed to be very individual. So why did you uh, why did you dabble in in the whole Wiccan thing? I mean, was it? Were you searching? Was it attractive because of the ritual? Was it because it seemed to be the antithesis of the sort of clean-cut, white-bread Baptist family that you came from? What was your motivation to, to make that jump? Uh, it, was, it was more like um, placating the other half. <laughs> yeah, just... I was, yeah, it was something I dabbled in just out of, you know, being able to understand, you know, the, the other point of view, because I was still a practicing Christian at the time. What's your perspective on the Church of Satan? You, uh, everybody around here, some people think it's, uh, yeah, it's a joke, and I get it. Other people say it's ridiculous and stupid. Uh, you know, opinions run the gamut. What's yours? Well, it's kind of interesting because, like we know, they are just atheists. And they are, I guess it's a good comparison with, with Satanists, from my point of view, is they're kind of like the uh, transvestites in the gay community. <laughs> We kind of, you know, stick our noses up at them, but they're just expressing themselves in a very theatrical way. Well, I appreciate your call very much, and I'm glad you're listening, and I wish you the best uh, during a difficult time with your family, my friend. I know it's going to be probably a rough few weeks, but for what it's worth, all my best, okay? Thank you, Seth, and I will definitely be calling back on a more uh, appropriate uh, subject. Sure. Go take care <laughs> of your family, all right? All right. You have a good one. You bet. That is tough. That is tough. I had uh, an excerpt here out of the second chapter from the book of Satan. It says this, Behold the crucifix. What does it symbolize? Pallid incompetence hanging on a tree. 
I question all things as I stand before the festering and varnished facades of your haughtiest moral dogmas I write thereon in letters of blazing scorn. Lo and behold, all this is fraud. Gather around me, O ye death defiant, and the earth itself shall be thine to have and to hold. Too long the dead hand has been permitted to sterilize living thought. Too long right and wrong, good and evil, have been inverted by false prophets. No creed must be accepted upon authority of a divine, quote-unquote, divine nature. Religions must be put to the question. No moral dogma must be taken for granted. No standard of measurement deified. There is nothing inherently sacred about moral codes like the wooden idols of long ago. They are the work of human hands, and what man has made, man can destroy. He that is slow to believe anything and everything is of great understanding for belief in one false principle is the beginning of all unwisdom. The chief duty of every new age is to upraise new men to determine its liberties, to lead it towards material success, to rend the rusty padlocks and chains of dead custom that always prevent healthy expansion. Theories and ideas that may have meant life and hope and freedom for our ancestors may now mean destruction, slavery, and dishonor to us. As environments change, no human ideal standeth sure. Whenever, therefore, a lie has built unto itself a throne, let it be assailed without pity and without regret, for under the domination of an inconvenient falsehood, no one can prosper. Let established sophisms be dethroned, rooted out, burnt, and destroyed, for they are a standing menace to all true nobility of thought and action. Whatever alleged quote-unquote truth is proven by results to be but an empty fiction, let it be unceremoniously flung into the outer darkness among the dead gods, dead empires, dead philosophies, and other useless lumber and wreckage. The most dangerous of all enthroned lies is the holy, the sanctified, the privileged lie, the lie everyone believes to be a model truth. It is the fruitful mother of all other popular errors and delusions. It is a hydra-headed tree of unreason. With a thousand roots, it is a social cancer. The lie that is known to be a lie is half eradicated, but the lie that even intelligent persons accept as fact, the lie that has been inculcated in a little child at its mother's knee, is more dangerous to contend against than a creeping pestilence. Popular lies have ever been the most potent enemies of personal liberty. There is only one way to deal with them. Cut them out to the very core, just as cancers. Exterminate them root and branch, annihilate them, or they will us. Second chapter of the book of Satan. It certainly makes for interesting reading. And I will finish the show by reading an email from Liz, who says this. I am a former Levian Satanist. I now consider myself an atheist. I rarely get to discuss my involvement and the positive outcome it had on my life because absolutely no one, all caps, no one I've talked to can get over the myths of the Church of Satan enough to hear the boring truth. The boring truth being that Anton LaVey did not believe in a god or a devil. His philosophy deconstructs Christianity, and it personally helped me undo the brainwashing I endured while growing up in an extreme evangelical Baptist church. No kidding. Think Billy Graham Crusades, church three times a week, homeschooling, focus on the family radio, and of course, church camp. I left the church at 14 years old and accepted that I must be just a bad Christian. After a few years, I no longer considered myself a Christian and began questioning Christian lore, dogma, and what I was taught. I became interested in Levian Satanism when I was 24. It lasted a few years until I felt I didn't need it anymore. L.S. Levian Satanism helped me call bullshit on everything that was so deeply embedded into me by the church. As a former Christian, the thought of moving directly to atheism seemed terrifying. I needed something to help me stand my ground against the ridiculousness of the evangelical Christian set of rules I'd been forced to live by. I was not ready to say, there is no God, but I was ready to start critiquing what I had been taught was God and what he supposedly demanded from me as a person and as a woman. Church gender roles were brutal. 
ALS allowed me to dip my toes into atheism. The first time I ever said out loud, there is no God, was soon after I started reading the Satanic Bible, which of course is a parody in itself and was written with a fantastic sense of humor. LS helped me realize I didn't need to worship anything or anyone. Levay and Satanism's principles are about worshiping human behavior or self. The Christian church taught and trained me to feel immense guilt over having sexual thoughts and desires and for feeling anger or sadness. Every time I felt those things, I would then feel like I was a bad person. These feelings of guilt stayed with me for years after I left the church. After reading everything I could get my hands on about Levay and Satanism, I realized those feelings were not only normal, but were also healthy. Not all of us former Christians can come to these conclusions ourselves. Sometimes we need a little help. Levay and Satanism, to me, was a kind of 12-step program for recovering Christians. And if you read any of the LS books with that in mind, it will make more sense. I truly believe that is what Anton Levay's intention was when he created it. During my time as an LS, I never worshipped his image or a pentagram or recited Latin over burning black candles. The aspect of magic in Levay and Satanism is also to be taken with a grain of salt. And I think Anton threw that in there for people who missed the ritual of their former religions or to cause controversy. Levay and Satanism really is the biggest troll on modern Christianity. Liz, thanks very much for the message. I have a confession. I started researching the show and even hosting the show thinking, well, I don't I totally don't get it. And and I'm still kind of there. I don't understand. I, I am I'm not of a personality type who enjoys, you know, the dressing up of costume and, and the theatrics and the organ music. I'm a pretty conservative cat. But I found the research I did into LeVay and Satanism and his life and his words and his work and even the readings and the teaching of the Satanic Bible, whether I agreed or not, I found them to be much different than what we were taught as children, much different than what I had expected. It's not a religion really at all. It's more of a philosophy for a living. It is a giant tweak to the established cultural taboos, right? The church says Satan is evil. Satan is all these things. Satan is responsible for what you feel and do naturally. And Anton LaVey said, fine, not only will we embrace what is natural for us to do, but we will call it the very name that you <laughs> hate and fear the most. Screw you. And I, ha I have to say, I kind of admire that. In the guy. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know that I, I, I see Satanism as, as do I see it as necessary? I don't know if necessary is the word. But honestly, if somebody wants to be an atheist and they want to integrate ritual and theatrics and all of these very colorful attributes into their atheism and call it Satanism or whatever, I myself think, well, what the hell? It's your life. You've earned the right to live it however you choose. And whether the church is dead on the vine or whether it's still around and relevant, or whether or not it just made a, an interesting 90-minute podcast here in the month of Halloween, it, it certainly is, I don't know, it's, it's something, I think, to, um, it's something, it, it's a much-needed wink, I think, at a very straight, stuck-up, guilt-ridden, and often repressed culture that tells you you're broken, that tells you that you are ill and sick and riddled with sin, and then tries to sell you the cure. I don't know, it's something worth considering. And in the meantime, if you're looking for some interesting reading, you might, I don't know, <laughs> you might crack open a little uh, satanic Bible there. And make sure you do it in front of the right company or it might affect your life adversely for years. Thanks for joining us. I will leave you with the words of LeVay himself. Take care. Man must quit kidding himself. Only when he emancipates himself from dubious interpretations of good and evil, when he truly can 
rise above good and evil, beyond good and evil, realizing that these terms are probably the most relative terms in man's existence. When he can accept the long, obscene name of Satan, because that is a dirty word, Satan, the occult world seems to find it even more so. When he can accept this word, this name, into his vocabulary as a sound to be honored, then he will be free. Until then, he will walk in fear of the very scapegoat he has created, and his potential guide will remain his nemesis. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com